marcha de esta. ¿Sí? Okay. Uh, good afternoon. I hope you enjoyed the lunch and uh, ready for the discussion of uh, a very important issues, the separation of the investigatory and uh, uh, at the judici uh, judiciary uh, personnel. Personnel, as I mentioned in the morning introduction, China doesn't have a perfect uh, separation uh, <coughs> due to the complicated reason at the uh, current uh, state. However, I think it is uh, fair to say that China has made a great offer, uh, effort to separate their investigation team and uh, the case reviewing committee within the same bureau. <coughs> I'm honored to be the moderator of this discussion since we have a great panel today. Um, we have uh, uh, Honorable uh, judge from the general code and uh, an award renowned attorney and the uh, formal head of DG, DGCOM uh, who will provide us the, the research from different, uh, very different uh, perspectives. I have no, uh, no doubt that uh, we will all benefit from their speech and uh, there uh, will be the question follow up. Firstly, please join me. Welcome Judge Michael, uh, Michael Wellington mm, um, from the, the EU General Court who has uh, res researched a lot of uh, 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 on procedural and uh, code for more independent of hearing uh, uh, official. Uh, so, Mr. Wenderwood, please. Do you hear me? I have to push it. Okay, yeah, that's technology. Um, thank you very much uh, for uh, these kind words, uh, Mr. President. Um, yes. We were just discussing uh, what was exactly expected from us uh, in this panel. Um, we received a very thorough report uh, in which there is a, a comparative study on due process issues. And one of the issues is, is due process uh, helped by separating powers. Of course, that's an old, very old debate we had in Europe already since the early 1960s. The debate was always, uh, yes, the commission is the policeman, it's the inspector, it is the prosecutor, it's the judge. So it's a very old story. Um, this story became, say, or the, the complaints about this combination of functions increased over the years. Uh, I think the first step, and I'm looking, John, that was in Musique Diffusion, in the pioneer case, where the issue surfaced when the fine suddenly went up. Uh, it surfaced again in polypropylene, uh, but each time the issue was discarded. Since the 1990s, uh, member states have copied the European model. So they also copied, say, the combination of functions which, logically speaking, should not be compatible. Um, and in that context, of course, cases have arisen and cases went to Strasbourg. And one of these cases is the case everybody knows, Menarini. And I think Menarini gives also, I think, the answer to the separation of function issue. Um, uh, rather than focusing on the, the separation within the organization between, say, the inspectors and the people who decide, uh, Menarini, and perhaps the case law of the court, and we'll come to that a bit later, looks at, the, say, the administrative process and judicial control, control on that process as a continuum. Right? So there is not a clear divide, in my perception, between what the administration does and what the judge does. It's one flow. And the judicial control at the end of the process is to make sure that all safeguards 
are being respected during the administrative procedure. Or to say it in French, uh, uh, le contrôle judiciaire est la clé de voûte. Uh, it's the, the key to the system as to the legality of uh, the system. So when we speak about these different phases, I would distinguish five of them. Uh, first, of course, the early investigation, uh, where in the past, by the way, and I'm looking to John, in DG4 at the time, there was an inspection mm. unit uh, and which essentially did uh, ECSE cases uh, and inspections in the steel field. So a separation functions at the investigation level. Then should there be a separation at the level of the adversarial proceedings, for example, when it comes to the statement of objections, then the way in which the commission adopts its decision. And I think there you have most checks and balances already in place and the role of the legal service, the hearing officer, and things like that. Then an additional phase, which is relatively new, uh, also in our case, which concerns the publication of decisions. Who decides on that? Because that becomes a very important issue in the light of follow-on litigation. And we see that type of litigation also coming to our court <coughs> right now. And then finally, the last phase, which is the phase of the court, which ha oversees whether the safeguards in those earlier phases have been respected. But that's not my topic now, and that's for the next panel. Um, the court, systematically, since the very beginning, but in particular in the Hearst case of 1989, made clear that uh, the safeguards which you have in one phase of the proceedings should not be compromised in another. In that case, it concerns the, the rights of the companies when uh, the inspectors visit the company. And the court uh, says so. Uh, it says it's necessary to prevent those rights from being irremediately re impaired during preliminary inquiry procedures. And so the idea is during the inspections, your rights, which you could, uh, say, call upon at the next phase of the proceeding, should not be impaired. That principle has, say, been applied systematically uh, by the court. Now, why do I say all this um, in respect of this report? Um, what I did, and I will not go in detail through all the cases, but when we have time for it, we may discuss it, I had a look at the case law of our court over the last three years, and I broke down the case law at these five stages. And then I had a look, would the issues which the court had to deal with not have arisen if there had been a separation of powers within, say, the administration, and would the result have been different? Now, the outcome of my uh, study is a bit disappointing, uh, except for one case, which I think is the UPS case, which deals with mergers and not necessarily with, uh, say, 101 and 102. Uh, my submission, but that's, I think, an issue for debate, is that it would not have made any difference. Uh, <laughs> the issue would have arisen anyhow if there had been a separation of functions. Now, for example, take a case like Goldfish on inspections, uh, the use of illegally obtained or allegedly illegally obtained evidence, would that issue have surfaced if there had been a separation of powers? I submit yes. And would the answer given by the court in that particular case have been different if there had been a separation of powers? I don't think that that would be the case. So the answer is no. And I have more of those examples, but I won't bore you by going through them uh, one by one. So that's the thesis I would like to defend. It would not have made much of a difference. I think the only nuance I see if there had been a separation of powers, but I think that's an issue for debate, is that the issues might have surfaced earlier on. That, for example, if there is some a dialectic process within the administration, issues might have been flanked earlier. I think that is perhaps possible if you have a clear separation of functions within the administration, but there I'm not so sure either. Um, so that's my thesis, but before, say, stopping to speak, I would like to make uh, two comments on, these on this thesis. First, 
the rights of the parties, so in the various phases of the decision-making, in these five steps. Of course, the, it is the Court of Justice which has the final say on these rights at the end of the day. Um, but I think it would be unfair uh, to the Commission to say that it's only the Court. In fact, it is there, again, a cycle. Right? If there are judgments of the Court of Justice, the Commission takes it up. And often, uh, these procedures which are developed through cases, which are, in a sense, uh, Le droit prétorien, uh, they are codified in, uh, in regulation. So it is an ongoing process. I would also like to say that even if in DG Comp there is no clear separation of powers at this stage, there are, I would say, internal checks and balances within the Commission, but my colleagues know this better than, than, than I do. Uh, you have the Commission's legal service. I remember from the time in DG Comp, that, that was not an easy hurdle to take. Huh? If the legal service is against you, uh, it becomes a tough internal fight. You have the College of Commissioners. Uh, you also have the hearing officer. You have the ombudsman, of course, outside the organization, but nevertheless, which has a, a, a look uh, at how the administration works. So in a certain sense, these internal rights safeguards are being dealt with in one way or another in a rather dynamic way. They lead to court cases, they lead to regulations, they lead to best practices, which then uh, the administration issues. Um, so that's my first, say, final comment. <laughs> the second, and that will be the really last comment, is the issue of incentives. Uh, the question is, of course, that if you don't have a separation of powers, the theory goes, or the idea of the intuition is that people would have some kind of prosecutorial, prosecutorial. Thank you. <laughs> bias. <laughs> uh, and that they would go for it, and that there would be no bricks. That might be true, but if you have a separation of functions, would the incentives not work differently? For example, if there was a separate investigation unit which came with a proposal which had to be submitted to a decision-making body within the same commission, would that decision-making body not have an incentive to justify its existence and to be even tougher, for example, than the prosecutor? I don't know. Well, that's an issue for, for research. I don't know that. That's probably something which deals with the, say, the way you build administrations. So all this to say that it, if, it, it would probably be an improvement, but I don't think at the end of the day, from a purely legal point of view, the separation of powers within a DG comp uh, would change the course of events as I see it in our case law over the last three years at our court. I thank you very much. And thanks, uh, wonderful judge. So uh, now let's hear from uh, our next speaker, uh, Professor John Templeland. Please. First of all, may I say that it's an honor and a pleasure to be at this conference. I will try to stick to the subject that uh, we've been asked to talk about in this session. But to begin, I want to point out to you that there are two serious defects in the Commission's procedure, and not only the one that is in, on the agenda. The first uh, defect is that, as we mentioned already this morning, commissioners who have not read the evidence or attended the hearing are finally responsible for the decision. I mention that, although it's not the subject of this session, because we have to remember that it is a serious defect uh, in the procedure, and therefore we shouldn't take any other defects uh, lightly. My first point about the failure to separate the job of drafting the statement of objections and drafting the decision is the result of perception. The perception of almost every lawyer who has appeared uh, in cases 
where uh, they have, uh, there's been a statement of objections and there's been an informal or formal uh, meeting uh, with the officials who wrote the statement of objections. It's beyond dispute that most lawyers with experience of this believe that it is extremely difficult to get the officials who drafted the statement of objections to change their minds. This is not a theoretical view about confirmation bias or psychology or sociology. It is the, the perception of practicing lawyers. And it's a very clear uh, impression that there is indeed a, a built-in uh, bias. The next question is, is this perception justified? On the basis of my experience in the legal service and my experience in the competition DG and some experience since I left the commission, which is now quite a few years ago, I have no doubt that the perception is correct in a few cases. I don't know how many, but it seems to me that the number of cases in which a an official or more than one official has had a fixed idea uh, and that this has influenced the course of the procedure, not necessarily the end result at the very end of the, the day, but certainly influenced the course of the procedure. I have no doubt that there are biases in the assessment of evidence, most particularly from time to time in the application of the law and in disregard of strong defense evidence or arguments. As Judge van der Waude has said, it may not make very much difference in the end. It's very difficult to tell. And I don't think, with respect to the judge, that that is what, what really matters. What matters is that this is a defect in the Commission's procedure which could be cured, could be cured overnight, it would not, require a, a change in the regulation, and it would be an improvement, as the judge said a moment ago. We are told by Christa Kaiser, among others, that there are a whole lot of safeguards, and indeed that's true. But let's look more carefully for a moment at what those safeguards amount to. The hearing officer is not required, is not expected as part of his or her job to assess the substantive issues. And if he or she does express an opinion at the interim stage after the hearing, that uh, recommendation, if it amounts to that, uh, is not known to the parties and can be ignored with impunity, qu quite safely by the cabinet, uh, by the rest of DG competition, and by everybody else concerned with, with the case. There are, we're told, undoubtedly, panels. Panels are not uh, set up in every case. They're used at the discretion of the DG competition when it's thought worthwhile to have them for one reason or another. Either the case is important or it's difficult or it's complicated or it's controversial within the commission. Hmm? <coughs> <coughs> but the identity of the members of the panel is not known to the companies. The views of the members of the panel are not known to the companies. The panelists will not read the entire file and they are not expected to read the entire file. It's not clear because there's no formal rules governing what their role is. It's not clear what responsibility, if any, they have or that they are really uh, taking. This is a token gesture and it's one where the end result of panels as well as all these other safeguards <coughs> excuse me, uh, is that responsibility is diffused. And diffused responsibility very often means that nobody is really taking the responsibility. Different people may be taking it in different cases. You don't know how influential the legal service is you don't know whether a particular uh, official has had a, a dominant influence on the content of the decision. So we're left with judicial review. Clearly there has been a change in the last few years in favor of stricter judicial review. It's not clear to me yet just how strict the 
judicial review by the general court really is. But we know that the theory says that the general court must give an opportunity to argue every issue of fact and of law that the companies wish to raise. <coughs> Let's assume that the general court is, is extremely strict and does everything that could possibly be required of it under the Charter and the European Convention. It seems to me that even on that assumption, uh, it is wrong that the parties should have to appeal to the general court before they are guaranteed an objective hearing. And it seems to me also that it's a waste of resources to have a system uh, in which uh, we can't guarantee, as far as humanly possible to guarantee, that the right uh, conclusion was reached at the first administrative stage. The important thing to remember is the point that was made by Professor Felser this morning, that the and was made by Judge van der Rauder a moment ago. <coughs> the review must be stricter if the procedure at the administrative stage is uh, unsatisfactory. And I'm expressing the view this afternoon that the procedure is unsatisfactory. Therefore, it's in the Commission's interest in order to give the Commission an easier time before the General Court to correct what I see as a defect in the administrative procedure. If the Commission would correct the defect, it might perhaps be a little bit more trouble at the administrative stage, but it would guarantee that a less strict review by the General Court uh, would be necessary. So I believe that it's in the interest of the Commission looked at from the point of view of an institution and not merely the convenience of officials in DG competition to make the proposals, to make the changes that uh, I'm suggesting and which many other people have suggested for many years. I remind you, if you've forgotten it, that uh, an OECD peer report on the Commission's procedure in 2005 said, and I'm quoting, some explicit separation between the investigative and the decision-making function may be inevitable <coughs> to secure judicial confidence in the quality of the Commission's decision. And they also said the most relevant measure of increased effectiveness will be whether the Commission's decision are better able to survive judicial skepticism. A wise judge in England a long time ago said that justice must not only be done, but must be seen to be done. Having the same officials write the statement of objections and write the decision is one of the two serious defects and it's of the Commission's procedure, and it's a defect <coughs> that could easily be cured overnight by an administrative decision of the competition commissioner and of DG uh, competition. The commission doesn't have to say that the present procedure is defective. All it has to say is that the present procedure could be improved in the way that I'm suggesting. And no single change would do more to increase confidence in the commission, even if, as I think we're stuck with solution for the time being, even if the commission decisions continue to be taken by commissioners who haven't uh, ever read the file or studied the evidence. Ladies and gentlemen, you're clear as to what I think should be done. Thanks, uh, Professor Joe. So the uh, it was an uh, excellent speech. Next one is uh, from uh, former <coughs> head of DGCOM, uh, Sir Philip Lau, please. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to be here. <coughs> I won't uh, disappoint you. I, I disagree with both my <laughs> fellow <laughs> panel members. Um, but I think that the issue of uh, improvement both in terms of uh, the rigor of 
the examination of the substance of a case, but also in the issue of whether the due process can be improved uh, should be an active concern of any competition authority. <laughs> um, I personally think that um, in relation to uh, a function which um, um, John Temple Lang uh, uh, had some years ago, uh, that the role of the hearing officer is extremely important in terms of guaranteeing due process. Um, and that um, further consideration could indeed be given to the, not just to his powers in relation to the, the organization of hearings. We've heard this morning how people get the impression that they're being, they're the subject of the Inquisition. <laughs> they, can't, they can't question anyone else. That's a, an issue which could be addressed uh, uh, clearly uh -huh. in respect of, of the hearing officer's powers. And um, as far as judicial review is concerned, and there, uh, on this particular issue, I slightly disagree with Mark uh, on the, on the uh, due process and whether we can look at this as holistically and say it will, in the end, any issue be dealt with. In mergers, for example, there are legal deadlines. Um, mergers... Um, the, the opportunity to, to, to enter into a merger occurs in a very narrow window of opportunity. And there is definitely little incentive at the moment in the Brussels, in the European system, for uh, parties to challenge that in an effective way. And that's intrinsic in our system. Um, which means that as far as merger control is concerned, it is very important that the internal checks and balances in the Commission are seen to be working effectively. Um, and um, this is in contrast to a company, for example, under 101 or 102, who has uh, a right to defend itself and where the, the, those deadlines, the, the impact on business activity is not so immediate. So I see some some serious reasons for taking into account the views of um, John and others about how you could improve the internal checks and balances. Now, when we come to internal checks and balances and the internal organization of, uh, of a competition authority, are we talking simply about due process? No, we're not. We're talking also about the efficiency and effectiveness in public enforcement and subsequently private enforcement of competition law and policy. And there are several examples in other uh, uh, authorities where um, the so-called investigatory role is separate from the prosecutorial role. Uh, the most radical of those is where the investigation is transferred from one institution to another institution. Um, however, the, we're talking about the Commission's um, structure in relation to an administrative system, not a pros prosecutorial one. Um, and in that administrative system, there is, as in many other uh, jurisdictions, not the US one, the uh, a reasonable confidence that an efficient administration can carry out an investigation in a transparent way, hopefully with clear theories of harm, <laughs> hopefully with, uh, with evidence. In my experience, uh, sometimes the two don't uh, match. <laughs> uh, um, but the issue as to whether you actually separate out um, your investigators from your so-called prosecutors, which is just simply, in effect, the word prosecutors is incorrect here. It is the second phase, the deeper phase of investigation on the, after the statement of objections, is, is something which can be debated, and we've debated it many times, 
And I really think there are several factors you've got to take into account. First of all, if you've got a case team um, looking into some complex theories of harm with a lot of um, data to be assessed, um, well, I think that there is some virtue in the continuity of knowledge before you get to the stage of a final decision. And that continuity of knowledge is, uh, has a, the discontinuity of knowledge has a s serious cost, which I don't think is really rebalanced by the idea that the second phase people will not be in some way have the same confirmation bias as the first set of people. My personal view, and I implemented some of the changes inside DG competition, was that um, it would be much more reassuring to have independent views from those who represent some core knowledge of economics, or core knowledge of law, and in certain cases where there is doubt, then get a fresh pairs of eyes team to um, look at the salient facts of the case, not regurgitate the whole case, <coughs> but uh, to be faced with a series of questions to be answered. And then there has to be some preliminary conclusion which uh, everyone shares together. Now, if you have a fresh pairs of ice team and they're responsible to the same director, <laughs> or director general, <laughs> who says, you shall decide. <laughs> you, you know way, which way I think. Um, I hope you'll decide in the same way. Then you've perverted the system straight, straight away. You've got to, it's got to be a genuine peer review process. And that can be done, but it has to be done with, in, with the authority of that, those in charge of the organization. And there, just to clarify how things work inside the Commission, certainly since 2002. You have the case team, also accompanied by its director. On one side of the table, you have the Commissioner on the other. You have the legal service at one end of the table and the chief economist at the other. Chris de Kaiser has described the role of the up, the the role of intervention of the chief economist, it's written down, by the way. I don't see why it shouldn't be public. <laughs> if, if it needs to be transparent. I don't see why we couldn't also make public how devil's advocate teams work. Um, that it's not an a, a, a obfuscated process at all. It's quite uh, clear. And the purpose of the presentation of the case team is to present to the commissioner, its conclusions on the case. And everyone has the right to intervene. This is not diffused responsibility. This is the ability for every single person with an expertise to bring it to bear on what will be the proposal of the commissioner. Now, I've lived through, I lived through uh, six years of that procedure. Uh, on many occasions, I disagreed with the case team, <laughs> and I took a different view. Sometimes the commissioner took a different view to what I said, <laughs> and um, uh, sometimes, to the chief economist um, would have a, a clear view, and the legal service too. And um, it, it was the result of that open discussion which you get then a proposal to the commission. Now, I know that a lot of lawyers and legal representatives, and I, I frequently work with them now in my uh, consulting uh, activity, um, would very much like to be able to burrow down into the minds of all the members of the case team, into the minds of uh, individuals in the chief economist team, in the legal service, to point out the differences of view 
which are in turn all to the Commission on a particular case. And the, those, by the way, those differences of view can change over time. But the important question is for the Directorate General, the service, the, the services of the, of the <coughs> Commissioner for, for Competition to hear all the views from these different instances and to take her responsibility or his to propose something to the Commission. Now, you'll say then, well, that's no good because these nasty other commissioners, they don't know what the case is about. Um, they haven't read the file. Uh, and by the way, they're all lobbying for certain political conclusions. We don't want them to be involved. So the commission's reaction to that was, no, we, we'll try and protect the investigation. We uh, uh, insist that the commission can only uh, make interventions, the other commissioners, on competition grounds in the, in the final proposals. And it's on that basis that this tradition of greater independence for the competition commissioner has, been, has, has come to, to have a, a very symbolic role inside the commission. So I don't believe that separating out yet another case team to do the second phase of, our, of an investigation will have much effect. I do, however, think that, um, uh, as Hugh Pate used to say to me, stop them before they kill again. <laughs> um, on some <coughs> cases, you get complete bias from an initial case team, and they have to be stopped in the tracks. And when we've appointed the first chief economist, uh, Henry Kröller, who is now economic advisor to Angela Merkel, perhaps he will come back to be the chief economist of the commission after Mrs. Merkel's departure. His first question, most important question, irrespective of whether there's an investigation team, prosecutor <coughs> team is, what's your theory of harm? And where are your facts? And I can assure you that the percentage of cases which were dropped increased significantly as a result of that discipline. Um, because you can, it's, a commissioner loves a big case. <laughs> but the commission loves big cases too. Um, and it, it needs, a, it, it, what happens is you get a case team which comes to you and says, um, uh, Commissioner, this, they've, uh, the parties are obviously wrong. This could be a very important precedent for the Commission. Um, we haven't got enough facts to support our theory of harm, but um, perhaps the parties will be able to supply them. <laughs> you know, that, that kind of um, uh, extreme view, which has to be stopped in its tracks. Equally, if the chief economist comes to you, and this happened on two occasions, uh, and says, Commissioner, uh, if you give us six months more, we can solve this case with our economic, economic metric model. No, you have to take a decision within the legal deadlines, an informed decision, but you've got to do it on the basis of the information available to you. That's efficiency and effectiveness of the enforcement process. Now, I've said all that in order just simply to contradict John and Mark, but I really do think that there are uh, things you can improve. I've mentioned the hearing officer. I, 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 uh, I also think <coughs> that in some way there could be some connection between the um, powers of the hearing officer and any referral on a procedural basis to the court, to the general court. Uh, the Competition Appeals Tribunal in London is able to intervene on such a basis um, uh, in, in London, I sat on the board of the CMA um, for three years, and I'm absolutely confident that that discipline, that, that knowledge that the CAT could intervene on procedural issues was extremely important for, um, for, the, future, uh, for the future of a case. Um, so um, I'm just wondering where we can uh, make progress elsewhere. I think Chris has rightly given you the catalogue of checks of, um, 
of uh, issues about access to file. <coughs> I think it is correct to believe that there's still some uh, work to be done on how the, how the hearings are organized um, because uh, if the idea is simply that all the intervening parties are going to ga gang up on you <laughs> in the hearing, then a lot of parties decide not to have it for that reason. Okay. And I dealt with the Microsoft and Intel cases, and they were, they were very reluctant to have a hearing <laughs> in both cases, not because they weren't wanting to explain their case, but they wanted to, uh, they, they did not want a, uh, a rather um, per perverse and puerile uh, <coughs> Uh, way of thinking about the hearing that is, oh well, we have 24 interveners, they're all against Microsoft, so we'll, um, we'll, all, we'll, we'll, we'll try and get them to agree to a hearing. We have to be clear about the language of why we have a hearing. If it is for the defense of the parties, then it is on that that it should be concentrated and that should be reflected in the time given for, for s speaking time given to everyone. And I, I think, too, Chris has mentioned earlier the issue of um, bringing key facts and key evidence forward before a statement of objections is the right thing to do in many situations. But I really don't think that um, concentrating on the issue of separation of powers, is uh, separation of functions, is going to help very much. I think that it will certainly make it more difficult to have uh, an effective and uh, uh, efficient uh, enforcement process. I think that uh, <coughs> the rights of defense, the due process, should be strengthened even further than they are now. Um, and I am personally very happy that we can see, at least in 102 and 101, a more active court, more active courts who are bringing together, uh, creating precedents which didn't previously exist in, in terms of substance as well as in procedure. So um, when we argued for at, at length about uh, a per se approach as opposed to an effects-based approach, both in mergers and in antitrust generally, um, I think there was some frustration that there wasn't sufficient case law to see whether that, whether that uh, issue was an important one. I've always thought that if you had a per se rule, it's not because it's simply written into the treaty that it has credibility, it's because that per se rule must be backed by his historical evidence of harm in every single case in which you apply that rule. Now, in the area of cartels, no one worries about that. It's clear. I still have to calculate damages afterwards, but um, in the area of, of 102, I also think that um, there could be areas where a, there could be a strong presumption of harm, but there still has to be a very thorough economic analysis of, of the facts. And, I, uh, and as Air Tours indicated to us, and other cases did too, the more complex a theory of harm we have in a case, the more the, the, is the, the burden of uh, proof is on the commission to show, to demonstrate that the story they're, te they're telling is convincing. So that's to start with. Thank you, <coughs> thank you, sir, uh, Philip Law, uh, and uh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, also thanks for all great uh, speaker uh, speakers. So now the follow is uh, the open for question. Any question and the comments, please.
Hello, uh, Clio Angélie from Northern Fulbright in London. I wanted to come back on two topics that have been discussed, um, which is the impartiality and the importance of showing impartiality to companies that are being investigated, as opposed to just stating that we are impartial. Um, and also, um, in that context, the stricter review that um, we might expect from the general court because of the potential shortcomings of the administrative procedure and the fact that there is no separation of function. So in that context, uh, I wanted to have your views on the recent ICAP judgment. Um, I thought it was, so perhaps I should uh, summarize the context. Um, I'm talking about this judgment so far as it concerns the presumption of innocence. Um, the court reviewed for the first time the commission hybrid staggered procedure in terms of settlement where the decision, the settlement decision is adopted first against the settling parties and then a few months later the non-settlement decision is adopted against the party decided to opt out. Um, in that context, I think that the general court found that there was a violation of the presumption of innocence but that violation did not um, justify an annulment of the decision because um, ICAP, who was the appellant, couldn't show that the decision would have been different but for this violation. Um, and that very test, to me, is questioning whether the review of the court is strict enough because you could interpret that as giving a bit of a carte blanche to the commission to just perhaps infringe the violation, the presumption of innocence without freeing any real consequence because the general court will review all arguments on liability and make sure that the decision is legal, but there is no separate sanction for a violation of presumption of innocence in itself. Thank you. Uh, first, uh, perhaps, uh, since we're speaking about due process, uh, perhaps I'll focus on that first and then come to your ICAP question. Um, on due process, perhaps uh, there is an important case uh, from the Strasbourg court <coughs> in Delta Pecarni. I uh, said so the absence of judicial review during an inspection must be compensated by strong judicial control ex post. And that's what I think our court is doing. Uh, for example, to stay in the Czech Republic, <laughs> I would like to refer to a case called Ceske Drahi, I hope I pronounced it correctly, as to the existence of underlying evidence before the Commission orders an inspection. And so the message from Strasbourg is that uh, any shortcomings in the administrative procedure must be sanctioned in one way or another by ex post judicial review. So that's hopefully the first part of your question. Then the second part of your question on ICAP, uh, maybe my age, but uh, I have seen, say, the reading of the judgment on the presumption of innocence dealing with the substantive infringement. Was there an infringement or not? And if my memory is correct, there are four or five types of agreements on these exchange rates, and on a couple of them, uh, the general court sides with the commission, but on two of them, uh, it doesn't. And the way, it say, the judgment is written is interesting. It says there is evidence, uh, there are signs, but I'm not fully convinced. So I have doubt in my mind, and the benefit of the doubt is to the applicant. So my reading of that judgment is, say, in a sense, more favorable <coughs> for the, the undertakings than it used to be in the past. Now I'm looking at Nicholas. We had cases like that in the past as well, GFE engineering for example, is also a case which goes that way, that if the administration has not shown beyond reasonable doubt that then uh, they say that the decision should be annulled. But here again, I'm in, say, going to, to speak about something Oof is supposed to speak about <laughs> in the next panel on the intensity of judicial review <coughs> on substance. So I hope I have more or less answered your questions. I, I just like to it's a bit niggling, but to come back, you said because <coughs> of the lack of impartiality due to no separation of powers. Now, and I really dispute this. You could have two independent case teams in DG competition coming in 
of the cases to the same conclusions. They're not impartial. They take a view based upon the culture, actually a culture which is very much influenced by their interlocutors, who are the legal service, legal teams, the real representatives, people around, around uh, DG competition. And their, their bias is, generally speaking, to prosecute. <laughs> I think that judicial review is important to, to, to check any uh, lack of respect to the due process, and this is why I'm very much in favor of doing something more on, in the, on the hearing officer's role in particular. But the, the, the court has actually, in my view, got to look, and it is looking, more and more at the substance of cases. Why? Because if there is a natural bias to a, a rather ambitious theory of harm, and the, the chief economist has been overruled on that <laughs> issue, and the director general perhaps as well, as in the case sometimes, um, th and the commissioner has decided uh, in favor of, of that theory of harm, then um, such complex theories of harm needs to be subject to judicial review and quickly. Um, and the quickly is something which the court has done something about as far as Modus is concerned. As far as 102 uh, and 101 is concerned, it's, it's, it's a constant battle to get it right. But don't think that because there <coughs> will be separation of functions inside an institution, it's going to lead to more impartiality. I don't think so. Yeah. Make a comment about the hearing officer. The trouble with the hearing officer on the moment is that his or her job is to say whether the procedural requirements have been respected. What that means is that he or she has to confirm, if it's true, uh, that an opportunity has been given to the companies to say whatever they want to say in response to the statement of ob objections. But he is not obliged or expected to say whether any attention has been given to what the party said. He is not supposed to make comments on the substance. Now, if there was an agreement which would involve an important increase uh, in the powers of the hearing officer by which the hearing officer's final report would express the hearing officer's view of the merits of the case, that would be an, in, an extremely important uh, improvement and one that I certainly would welcome. But that was considered a few years ago and was apparently rejected completely. And although it has been suggested many times in one way or another since, uh, the Commission has always set its face against it. I regret this very much, but I don't think that unless and until that change is made, uh, tinkering with the details of what the hearing officer is supposed to do is, is going to make any difference. I just dispute one sentence there with John. Uh, is, are we talking about the hearing officer taking a view about the merits of the case <coughs> as a whole, including the substance, or we ask him to take a view about how the investigation has been conducted in order to re reach the right solution. Now, in a lot of cases now, everything is driven by data and access to data. And it seems to me, as far as I gather, the, the hearing officer takes a strong view about access to data and organization of data rooms, et cetera, et cetera, which means that he must have, or she must have, he, he must have some view as to the alternative theories of harm and why the data is necessary to be, to be given access to the parties or to intervening parties in order to back that up. So I think I'm, I'm, more, at, at, I'm more optimistic than John is about the ability of, of the hearing officer with a certain number of increased powers and backing in relation to the court um, to actually glide very easily into substance because it's inevitable if you're running an, if you're 
policing an investigation, you need to know what is what is the what is the data required to uh, verify the alternative theories which are presented. Next question. <coughs> thank, thank you. I'm Carly Eichen. I'm with Jones Day in Brussels. Uh, Sir Philip, you mentioned how um, how important it is for those internal checks and balances in TG Comp <coughs> to be there and be, to be seen to work in particular in merger cases, and I think you've separated mergers from, from antitrust in a, in a couple of other remarks as well. And as, as practitioners, we know that the only way you can manage to get your deal cleared is by engaging meaningfully with the case team. There's no option of, of having a shot at it and going to court because of the urgency. So the same strict legal deadlines and the urgency that is embedded in the DG comp procedure is that there for a reason, of course. Um, you can have a a judgment overturning a cartel case or an abuse case a few years later won't be that dramatic. Having a merger being cleared by the court a couple of years later is pointless. So uh, one other thing one could consider is to make judicial access meaningful for mergers by way of perhaps working also outside of comp and trying to inject even more urgency into the judicial review process in Luxembourg to see whether that could be something that in, you, you said how, how extremely important for a case it was to know that the cat would be there, right? Um, influencing your decision making in, in, within the CMA or the OFT. Um, similarly, could that inject a little bit more of um, other thinking into comp if, if there would be something that would be even more meaningful, even more accessible by way of judicial review? Well, I, th I think that if the, the advantage of the CAT system in, in, in London is precisely its, its uh, capacity to discipline the behavior of the case teams. By the way, ask anyone in, in the CMA who takes the final decision. <laughs> and it's rather, <laughs> it's even less clear than it is in the commission. That's another question. Uh, <laughs> that doesn't make it any better. <laughs> but no, no, I'm just, I'm just making a side swipe at those who think that um, there are, there's a hierarchy in this. There isn't. Everyone's struggling with the same issues. But I, I think that if, if there was some <coughs> ultimate threat triggered by a negative view of the hearing officer about a certain conduct uh, of the investigation, threat of referral, then it would have, as you say, some incentive effect on the on the on the merger because there are other things in the merger system at the moment which are are problematic and that is that because there's strict deadlines there seems now on both uh, by, on by, uh, behalf of the parties and the commission an endlessly long pre-notification uh, phase where um, there too I think due process has to be applied <laughs> because uh, if you go through six requests for information before you get to being able to notify your merger or it being declared complete, then the question is raised as to whether the Commission is actually carrying out the investigation before it's notified, before the merger is notified. So, but these are things which I think could easily be corrected with a certain discipline on it. Perhaps if I may add something to that, uh, urgency in merger control proceedings is very subjective. Uh, what is exactly the objectivity of urgency in merger control proceedings? One is asking for an authorization. Um, so that's a bit of a philosophical question. And then what Philip says is, yeah, I fully underline that most to say, at least my experience in the past, that much of the work is done before the merger filing. And then when it comes to our procedures before the general court, uh, there's also, of course, a lot of urgency. But the parties don't make it easy for us. Uh, merger cases before us are a procedural nightmare because of confidentiality issues. Uh, so the urgency, which seems to be there in the air, is not, say, perceived, say, in the same way by all the, by all the parties. And the obstacles we see uh, in many of these cases uh, to deal with the case rapidly uh, is 
become increasingly difficult because of all the confidentiality questions we have to deal with. Next question. Yeah, Thomas Wesley, Freshfields. <coughs> I just wanted to echo the very important point you made, uh, Philip, about uh, <coughs> this question, separation of uh, investigatory and prosecutory personnel and adjudicative personnel for merger control again. Um, <coughs> since uh, in merger control, in, in cartel and dominance cases, you go to court, as a colleague from Jones Day already said, but that is something you don't do normally in merger control cases, but indeed the parties are interested in settling the case with the commission. So at a certain point, you give up on the substantive discussion. You think you're still right. You think the procedure was unfair, but what can you do about it? Yeah? <coughs> and uh, you engage in remedy discussions, and this is how you solve the cases. And this leads to a situation where the commission is basically unchecked by judicial review in the merger control area. <coughs> Just to be more specific, we have the new test since 2004. We have now 14 years and not a single judgment on the new test. The commission is simply doing what they think is fair. And the commission is pursuing policy where they're expanding the new test, where <coughs> the vice director general is speaking about aligning the new test with, art with the test in Article 101 which is all valid views, but no judicial review whatsoever. The commission is developing innovation series of harm in huge mergers. There is no judicial control of any of that. And <coughs> that is why this question gets so important, but unfortunately I don't have an answer to that either, <laughs> how to organize it, other than that I agree with you. If you have a separate panel with DG competition still reporting to the same commissioner, I think that's not worth the while. It's just a, a procedural hassle. Thank you. Uh, but the, the fact that there has been no cases, cases so far on the issue of s significant impediment to effective competition compared with dominance, that may be true. I'm not sure that there have been many cases where the Commission has entirely relied on non-coordinated effects to base the theory of harm. I think it's a pretty rare animal. But um, it, it th there would be no harm, and certain companies have, been d have done it in the past, to take a case um, uh, accepting the imposition of remedies, that where, but where they object in principle to the remedy imposed. Now, I'm not sure whether that's still possible uh, I'm talking as a non-lawyer here, <coughs> and, uh, but it, it seems to me that if, if a remedy is, is, is judged to be disproportionate by the parties and maybe by outside commentators too, uh, that is an issue of proportionality and of fairness which the court surely would have a view on. Um, you could say the same thing of plea bargaining in the States. You know, that, that there's nothing at least in the Commission's uh, practice, everything is written down. In plea bargaining, you, know, you, you have an acceptance of, of a deal. It is also true to a certain extent of the settlement uh, issues in, in, in cartel cases in, 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 in Europe. But it, it would seem to me that that issue of disproportionality needs to have some channel of for impa impacting at least future commission work. Um, and um, I don't think you can blame it on one or two particular officials. I think this is a question of the administration as a whole taking a view. Uh, there are, of course, among us all, those who take more, ex more rigid views than others. But it's the duty of the Commissioner, but also of the Director General, to correct those things. <laughs> Don't forget there is supposedly hierarchical control in the Commission, not just checks and balances of, of chief economists and legal services. You've got to take your own responsibilities for the behavior, the conduct of, of, the, of, the, of, of the staff. And it's not just a question, too, of um, whether the Ombudsman can have a view. <laughs> He will, generally speaking, the ombudsman has a view, but uh, 
and it, but it will be rather a dry view <laughs> and won't help you very much. What, what's key is whether you're intervening in the right cases with the right answers uh, in a rigorous way, using the resources you have to the maximum, but guaranteeing mm -hmm. that um, both defending and intervening parties, uh, uh, their rights have been equally heard. And the remedy issue is an important one. Anyone else? Okay. Please. Thank you. Uh, Mattia Meloni from Luxembourg Competition Authority. Uh, you discuss a lot about check and balances, uh, the role of hearing officers, but none of us uh, uh, talked about the advisory committee role that I think is something quite important that is a bit underestimated right now um, in, in, uh, in, in the procedure before the commission. So uh, you know that you know, uh, advisory committees since, 2001, 2000, since 1st May 2004, all NCAs attend those meetings, so they can Apport, uh, give some added value to the draft decisions of the commissions. But up until now, uh, the role has been, to my humble opinion, underestimated. So I would like to hear from you um, about this. Thank you. Uh, I don't want to push it so far as to say is that the hearing of the advisory committee is a substantial formal requirement. Uh, I'm looking at John, who goes perhaps a bit further back in time, but I think it was said in a case called ACF Kemi Pharma somewhere in the 60s uh, in the Dystuffs cartel. And recently, in another case, Riva, uh, the court, general court, annulled the decision simply because uh, the hearing didn't take place uh, in the presence of the members of the advisory committee. So in the perception of uh, the, the general court and the court of justice, uh, having the advisory committee is uh, a very important element. Um, and I would even suggest that to say, uh, having uh, say, if the, <coughs> the advisory committee is not heard uh, at all, that that would be a, a direct cause for annulment. Last question. But there, um, in the reign of Joachim Amulia, he, he took a decision uh, against the, the majority of the advisory committee on a telecoms issue. I think the, the, ex the expression in our guidelines or in the regulation is take utmost account of the, of the opinion of the advisory committee, and he ignored it. Mrs. Pestaya changed that view, <laughs> and she took utmost account of the view of the uh, competition national competition authorities about telecoms mergers four to three. The last question. Thank you, Emma Jean Hinchy, Court of Justice. In a former life, I was a practitioner as well, and I have been in the past in the unenviable position of trying to prove my client was not tacitly colluding with other parties in the market. And already, as a, as a, as a party, you're in the back foot if you're trying to prove you tacitly did not do something. And you try and produce your evidence of your clean pricing and your economic, econometric models of how the pricing has happened in the markets. And the commission says, well, we're not convinced, or the case team is very, very attached to their theory of harm. And you have your decision, and you go to contest your decision. And what I would posit, and I would like your comment on, is you come to the general court then, and then you say, well, you're trying to demonstrate a manifest error of assessment. And I think the way this separation, or non-separation of, of investigatory powers works is that you're already ha carrying a very heavy burden of proof by the time you get to the general court. Because you can say, oh, well, look, we, dem we provided pricing data, and the general court will say to you, well, yes, it was taken into account, but it was dismissed in the decision. And you say, yes, but that was wrong. And then you're trying to show that the commission was manifestly wrong. And uh, what I would posit to you is that the, the way the procedure works is that it puts a very heavy part burden on the parties when they come to contest it afterwards in judicial review. I will pass this question on to the next panel. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
to Ulf because he's uh, so I uh, the uh, well I will not uh, say <laughs> deal with that question but uh, I would like to point uh, to one case which is the UPS case you remember that I I said that uh, the separation of functions would have made much of a difference. I don't know, uh, from, from our perspective, whether that would be uh, make much of a difference. The only difference I see is probably the timing when an issue surfaces. Uh, and I think the UPS case, for example, if, uh, if there had been internal <coughs> checks and balances and on the possibility uh, for the firm to have access to the latest theory of harm yeah. in that case. That might have made uh, a, a difference. So that's uh, uh, one comment or uh, reaction to your question. Then as to, uh, without going into the manifest error uh, question, but of course if your theory of harm is just as probable as the <coughs> theory of harm put forward by uh, the regulator, in this case the European Commission, there's very old case law, Woodpulp, and recently confirmed in CISAC, that says that if both theories of harm in a repressive setting are equally plausible, then uh, the theory put forward by the applicant prevails. I, I just want to make one comment before we stop, yeah. and that is um, maybe some of the arguments which have been put forward now for separation of functions are in fact arguments really in favor of a prosecutorial mm -hmm. system yeah. rather than a separation of the functions themselves, which I continue to argue could, could make a difference, but could be easily corrected if indeed you had much greater and uh, earlier access to the to data. And as far as um, speculative theories of harm, and I say tacit collusion is by definition, speculative. I mean, what 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 data is there to 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 tell you wh which which direction to go? And if the commissioner is prepared to propose to a college a fine on the basis of speculation, then the court should be very much open to looking at that in substance as well as in in proceed in process. Okay. So, so I have one follow-up question, some quick one. Um, I agree with what uh, Judge uh, van der Waude said, and I said this earlier today myself. Um, it's communicating pipes in a way, if you have less separation of power at the commission level, you need more judicial review and, and the other way around. So, but, but one thought, is it really only a timing issue because the commission has access to different kind of expertise and resources, whereas at the court you have excellent lawyers and expertise there. Um, so could this make a difference or make it important at which level this kind of review takes place? And I know that I'm contradicting what I said myself, but. <laughs> what I'm going to say is perhaps a bit delicate, but if you have a competence as a court to deal with certain issues, you must deliver, full stop. Okay. <laughs> it's okay? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so because of the time limit, so we have uh, we have to put on the end to to the discussion. So is it uh, is it is for sure uh, that our report will benefit uh, from the whole discussion. And um, I would like to thank for all three great speakers for uh, for your for their a wonderful job so and uh, thank uh, thank for you all the uh, uh, participation thank you, thank you.